Okay, it's now a couple of minutes uh, past 11, so we'll get started. People can still join. This is aiming to be a, a somewhat informal discussion, um, I guess. First up, uh, people can hear me okay, right? Cool, I'm getting nods. So, it's been a little while since we had these monthly webinars and we're sort of uh, shifting the format up a, a little bit. So whereas previously they were uh, very much oriented towards yeah, a presentation of some sort, uh, now we're still going to have a presentation of some sort, but it'll be a, you know, a relatively small portion, kind of you know, 15 minutes. And our aim is to, you know, for this to be kind of a, you know, a very interactive forum uh, you know, for, I guess us to communicate, nurse to communicate with our users and our users to communicate with nurse and with each other. Um, and because we're you know, looking for that interactivity and you know, slightly less formal uh, approach, um, you know, I highly encourage you to join the nurse users Slack channel if you haven't already and do most of the text chatting there in preference to the um, Zoom chat facility. So using Slack for chat has got a few benefits in it. Uh, yeah, it sticks around and, and it is very easy to break out into side conversations as well with, uh, with Slack. Um, oops, is that through too interesting? So the plan for today um, is, uh, I think I posted out the agenda earlier, but so we're going to start out with a kind of a, a win of the month. Uh, the idea here is just, you know, open open discussion. Share something, uh, something you achieved, and it can be, you know, it can be something small. It can be, you know, solved a bug, got a paper published. It can be something big, you know, achieved a, a major run or a milestone in a project. Um, yeah, we're looking for um, sharing success stories. Uh, you can also nominate um, somebody else that you know achieved a big win. Um, yeah, this could be a, a good source also for, uh, or, or a good place to learn about, um, you know, science achievements that are being made at NERSC uh, or using NERSC facilities, uh, which could also lead into so, you know, nominations for some of the NERSC awards that happen. So we have, uh, oh, we'll come on to the details of that shortly. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into Today I Learn, which is kind of the other side of uh, yeah, not everything is is successes all of the time. Sometimes yeah, we get burnt, we get stuck, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit painful at the time. But you know, usually in the long run, there's something to learn from it, and yeah, at the very least, there's something that we can kind of teach each other from it. You know, give give each other a heads up about um, yeah, how to avoid a particular problem, or you know, identify something that is not as trivial as it might sound or not what it looks like. Uh, you yeah, know, this can also help us to find, you know, places that we can tweak our documentation, for instance, and hopefully improve everybody's experience. Uh, we'll have a, a space to make announcements and, you know, calls for participation. And this is not a one-way thing. The intention is, again, if there's something that you know about that would be yeah, good to have more nurse users involved in, uh, we'll announce it there. Uh, and then we'll spend a while on our topic of the day. And today our topic of the day is uh, PSPS preparedness. And PSPS for those not in California is public safety power shutdowns. Um, come wildfire season for, this is the, the second year when this is a, you know, a, a significant likelihood that we need to prepare for. Uh, PG&E, which is the utility provider that uh, provides nurses electricity, uh, on high risk days, uh, aims to minimize that risk by uh, cutting out uh, power to some regions and that can impact mass. So we'll, we'll talk a little about that. Uh, and then just to finish off with uh, a few moments to uh, think about topics for upcoming meetings and a quick look at our operational numbers for the next month. So let's start out with a win of the month, please unmute yourself and chime in sort of with uh, yeah, 
whatever you'd like to say. Um, yeah, tell us, tell us all about an achievement, either yours or somebody else's. Stephen, feel free to go ahead if you raise your hand. Hi, um, I, I was pleased my postdoc, Anthony Kremen, just got a urgent HPC paper um, accepted on our use of the NERSC real-time queue for our data processing for our data from the telescope throughout the night. Um, so, you know, it's been a, a very good thing for us, for DESI, for, you know, using the real-time queue at NERSC. It's been very helpful for us, and it's nice to see that turning into a conference paper. So, we were excited about that this morning. Nice. Urgent HPC is uh, a workshop at the SC conference, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's nice awesome. Way. Congratulations. I see Stephen Scott raised his hand. Yeah, so I had a paper accepted by the uh, Journal of Plasma Physics. We run a code at NERSC that was actually written by a group in Finland, which computes the orbits of uh, energetic uh, alpha particles in tokamaks. Uh, the worry is that uh, under certain circumstances, they can be lost from the plasma and, and overheat the wall. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm part of a, of a team that's designing about a $400 million tokamak that will, uh, for the first time, produce more power out than power in. So we're, we have to worry about possibly having 100 megawatts of these alpha particles running around. Wow, that's great. Megawatts. That's, um, that's, that's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, and a, a tokamak that produces more energy than put in. That's great. So, so the key insight here is a, is a new technology called high temperature superconductors. And it turns out that the, the, the key improvement is not so much that they can go to higher, like, uh, higher temperature, but they can go to higher field. You can almost double the field compared to normal superconductors. And the performance of a tokamak goes as the fourth power of the magnetic field. So it's a, it's a big win. Fantastic. Rush. Yeah. And Stephen, I think I remember helping you on a ticket or two. So I'm yes, gonna... I've, I'm a, I'm a, a regular customer to the help desk. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to feel like I contributed somehow to this too. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, what I should have been doing was uh, taking notes, but that actually reminded me, I think I noticed a little uh, indicator that we are in fact recording this meeting. So um, uh, yeah, I guess please be aware of that. Um, if, if you do have any objections and have spoken so far, drop us, drop us a line afterwards. But um, so we'll, We'll put the recording on the um, on the webinar page. So this one over here um, after the meeting. Okay. Um, I have too many windows open. So <laughs> I have a. I have what feels like a much smaller scale win, but I think it, I think it, it, it still counts as a win. Um, we've got these meetings up and going again. It's been yeah, it's been several months, and um, I'm very optimistic that an interactive format will um, you know bring something new to NERSC's uh, user group, and um, you know encourage uh, a lot of uh, yeah collaboration and and sort of yeah mutual support for each other. Does anyone else have a shout out they'd like to make before we move on? So this is Cheyenne from PNNL. I would like to uh, report a minor win as well. So recently our work on um, graph triangle counting was, uh, won the graph challenge champion in, uh, in, in the HBEC, in the IEEE HBEC conference. So they run a 
yearly graph challenge competition and we kind of compete and this year we competed on the graph a triangle counting and although it's not the best algorithm out there but it's a distributed one so it won the graph challenge uh, championship so we are quite excited about that wow that's nice. amazing well done well done uh, so i guess the key insight there is that um with a, a distributed algorithm even if it's not the best serial algorithm um you know you can do things that you can't necessarily do with the serial algorithm and, and yeah, you can actually target a larger graph, and uh, and 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 my my interest was mainly in um, uh, in stressing the network and test, you know testing the communication pipeline. So it's also a very nice mini application or uh, my a benchmark which helps you assess the MPI and the interconnect performance. So uh, so that way also it's kind of nice, and I'm planning to use it for. Uh, you know, or some other uh, benchmarking efforts as well. So yeah. does it does what? it stress it with oh, a sorry. lot of small messages, or is it like big bandwidth? Messages? So it's a it's a very irregular kind of uh, um, uh, irregular kind of uh, algorithm. So what happens is that, as you can imagine, uh, graphs have different varied degree of uh, a varied degree. So the messages sent out will kind of is proportional to the number of edges attached and that varies a lot. So even if you are using a, a, a collective operation, uh, so collectives are very good as long as you have like equivalent amount of sends and receives, then you get good bandwidth. But if it's uh, varied, then you have this, um, uh, you know, uh, you have the effect of synchronization. So some of the processes will finish quickly and they have to wait. And that kind of is one of the major bottlenecks with graph workloads. And uh, unfortunately, MPI has this new neighborhood collective uh, uh, operations, but they are not very optimal as well. So, uh, so graph workloads usually, you know, they, they have this, uh, because of the irregular, inherent irregularity, uh, they suffer a lot from uh, the communication overhead. Right. So this makes for a, a fairly tough benchmark to test, to test yes. the network. Yes. And the implementation. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it occurs to me that yeah, we've had a, a few pretty interesting stories there about quite disparate um, fields. Um, what we might do after the meeting is I'll uh, scroll up some notes with sort of you know, who, who have what stories and put them in the webinars channel. Um, because if others, uh, other users, you know, work overlaps those fields in some way, that, you know, it might be interesting kind of yeah, discussing with the, the people who have spoken about what they did and how they did it. And kind of, you know, uh, develop our capabilities off of, off each other a bit. So then the other side of the coin, but it doesn't have to be the other side of the coin, um, is today I learned. Um, so interested here in, in stories that people have, uh, something that surprised you that it might benefit other users to hear about you know and, and might help us to um you know, identify things that we can either document better or you know add some pointers to so yeah for instance you know something you got stuck on uh hit a dead end turned out to be wrong about um some tip that doesn't have to be a negative thing it can be you know i discovered that if i you know adjust my timing of my jobs a little bit you know made them shorter and wider i you know saved X amount of uh, queue time, and you got a better end to end time. Uh, or even just something that's kind of relevant to NERSC users that you learned that's an interesting pointer. So I can uh, start this one off with, with something that's sort of in that third category. Uh, you may have heard of the ECP, Exascale Computing uh, pro Project. 
and it has a, a section, I guess, called ideas and uh, particularly a webinar series called best practices for HPC software developers. And I'll put, I'll put a link in the Slack channel about it. So anyway, uh, th there's been some really interesting talks in this series. And so, you know, I, I often try to you know, either attend or, you know, log in afterwards and, and have a look at the talks. And uh, about a week ago now, uh, I was catching up on one that I missed, um, you know, previously, which was called Color Mapping Strategies for Large Multivariate Data in Scientific Applications. And, uh, and it turned out to be one of those, you know, hey, this is amazing and I wouldn't have thought of this. So, so I want to call it out. Go uh, take a look. So the, the speaker actually came into scientific computing from an art type of background. And she's talking about how to uh, choose and use a color palette to better communicate um, your findings in scientific visualizations. So that, um, yeah, it turns out kind of, yeah, the, the naive way of doing visualizations that I've always used where you put lots of bright colors because they stand out um, actually isn't as effective as using a, you know, a much more muted color palette and using brighter colors and um, you know strong hues or strong saturations just for, for specific information. And, and she tells it really well. So, so that's my today I learned and there's a, a link in the Slack to the, the list of um, webinars and it's a fairly recent one as well. Yeah, the, the, the second or third one on the list. Yeah, take a look. Anybody else got uh, a, uh, a hard lesson or just a lesson that um, they're interested in passing on? Uh, Grigor, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, this, this might be a really small thing and most of you may already know about that, but I found out last week that there's a job script generator on NERSC's website that helped me to optimize uh, the, the runtime a, a tiny bit, but still something. I, I didn't know about this, yeah. This was yes, and nice. this is the sort of thing we're looking for because these little tidbits like that, you know, there are a lot of them and just being aware of them, um, you know, it's, it's it's great to find out about. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, hopefully you can see this on the, the screen. Here's where it is. It's under my.nurse.gov. Yes. Under the jobs tab. Uh, I see uh, Kwechi also has a hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, by the way, I also uh, heavily use this, this uh, job script generator. Uh, whenever we got new member, you know, who's using, started using NERSC, we really recommend him or her to go to that, you know, script generator first and then run uh, those models. So I really appreciate that. And uh, what, I, uh, what I think I'm learning or I learned recently is, uh, the first is very simple one. And I'm not, the result may not statistically significant yet, but I noted, uh, so we changed the uh, default uh, building from static to uh, dynamic uh, linking, and then, but our model we use climate model to you know uh, we use the atmosphere or climate model. They are basically then we run over many nodes. So currently I'm running a global simulation. The grid space is thirty kilometer, so it's kind of high resolution, and uh, it takes some quite a long time. And they, I noted the initialization takes some time to 15 to 20 minutes. That's even actually even lower resolutions. And then I just try to put this, uh, you know, environment variable, you know, may, you know, build a model with static linking instead of default dynamic. And then it does change initialization time to like 15, Sometimes actually even debug queue didn't finish initialization, but after I introduced this uh, environment variable and make it build it statically, then it's like a few minutes. So 
I have still still need more statistics, but uh, from the several cases I run as a test, that does make a difference. So that's one thing, a small things, but it's kind of helping me. Another thing I'm learning is actually the I start I'm trying this spec, the tool to install so you know complex libraries and, and softwares and there's a documentation now and i was going through the tutorial i want i wonder how many people actually uh are aware of this and they're using it and i'm just starting using it it's so cool it's just like a conda for python i just you know look at i can clearly see a list of those libraries i need like an fcdf or whatever and but however i'm just Currently, I'm having a, a trouble because the library I, I wanted to install is ESMF. That's a system modeling framework that many uh, models in our field uses this to they provide lots of nice tools to remapping, for example, between different grid. But uh, I just wanted to use this offline for myself and try to install this spec, but. Uh, not quite successful yet. So I'm now trying either continue, try to install SPAC or maybe just install myself or this, some of the libraries installed as a part of other libraries like NCO, for example, that's also installed or, or NCL that's also installed by NASC folks. So I'm gonna I'll try a different path, but probably I might just issue a ticket for better help. I'm more curious about the SPAC way. So, yeah, uh, that's the few things I'm learning, and thank you for some documentations. So, so we're getting pretty interested in in SPAC as well. Actually, we have been for a little while, and so something you may or may not have um, discovered yet is that you can do module load SPAC on Cori, mm -hmm. and we have set up a, a user facing SPAC instance, uh, I, and we're using setting up. Are you using that? Yeah, I, I usually, yeah, I use uh, module load spec and then, yeah. yeah, following the documentation at NASC website and then uh, there's a link from there to tutorial. So I've been going through yep. those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you do get stuck, um, definitely drop us a line because um, we're, we're kind of hoping to yeah, increase our, our usage of that as a way to make it you know, easier for people to install software, uh, you know, especially when there's complicated, um, uh, what do you call it, you know, combinations of versions and dependencies that people need. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that, that's good to know and let and yeah, open a ticket uh, by all means and we'll uh, see if we can uh, help uh, improve on that. Thank you. Um, and uh, so the uh, also interested to hear your experiences, um, perhaps off offline or in the in the Slack channel later about static versus dynamic linking with the climate code. And if I remember rightly, the environment variable that you're talking about is export uh, Cray link type equals static, or possibly Cray PE link type equals static. Yes. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a good heads up. Uh, so we're moving along time-wise, so we might uh, stop at that one and, and step on to announcements and calls for participation. So uh, there are a number of things. I know the email is a, a very long email, <laughs> uh, so it's pretty easy to miss things, but probably uh, a couple of you know, important upcoming things that are, are good to know about that you can go back and check your email for the details about that is big one. Uh, we had announced uh, about the power upgrade happening October 7 to 12. And the, the great news is that the uh, facilities, people have managed to arrange it that for the, the, the power upgrade, uh, it should be able to happen without impacting Cori. So um, yeah, uh, the, some of the auxiliary things like Cori GPU will still be affected. You know, the great news is we won't have to take an outage for that. Um, 
HPSS has a new file system like interface. Take a look at that. Um, very important, the OCAP allocations process closes in less than two weeks. So yeah, make sure you get your um, OCAP request in. Uh, and we have uh, office hours coming up uh, October 1 and October 5, so if you've got questions about the process. Uh, a couple of announcements about so the uh, Better Scientific Software Fellowship uh, closes in less than a week. And if you would like to be involved in the SC21 conference, um, it's uh, looking for volunteers now, and it's a, a great way to um, you know, get to know a broader range of the, the supercomputing industry and other yeah, participants and users in it. Uh, now, uh, Johan has mentioned you have an announcement about Julia. This sounds interesting. Hi, yes. Uh, just a quick announcement. Um, we have a Julia module available at, on Cori now. Um, so this module, it currently has version 1.4. Uh, 0.2 and um, we'll be upgrading that uh, well we'll be adding a 1.5 version uh, soon um, this module also uh, manages the Julia depot path so um, uh, some packages that that many users might need and need to be configured for Cori uh, specifically such as uh, MPI are managed in that path, so you don't have to rebuild it. Um, they they automatically get included, um, and I'll be expanding the available modules um, based on uh, popular demand, essentially. Um, yeah, so that's that's everything uh, regarding Julia. Um, I guess I, I can also quickly remind everyone if you uh, still uh, want to answer the uh, office hours survey. Uh, that was sent out a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm looking at the data now, so uh, if you want to get your opinion in there, uh, let me know uh, sooner rather than later as well. Thank you very much. Cool, thanks, Johan. Um, yeah, if if you haven't encountered Julia yet, take a, take a look. It's a, a really interesting and promising language. I've kind of started, uh, yeah using it a little and, and uh, learning it just recently. And um, it, it fills uh, some of the same niche that Python fills, but being a compiled language, um, it can you know, get past some of Python's um, performance challenges. So yeah, that one, that one looks really promising. It's good to, good to see that uh, it's available on NERSC now. Actually, a year or two ago, um, I think the first Julia program to pass a Peter flop ran at NERSC. And I think that made Julia only the fourth programming language that's hit that performance level. Sorry, I forgot to mention, I'm also I'm working right now on a, a Julia IPython kernel. So in the next couple of days, um, on uh, jupyter.nurse.gov, uh, Julia will also be available. Uh, yep, that would be nice. That's a, yeah. Good, uh, development environment. Um, does anybody else have any announcements or CFPs that they you know, know about or would like to um, tell other nurse users about? Excuse me, can I ask a quick question about Julia? Because I, ne I never really uh, tried uh, or learned Julia yet. Uh, so sure. on, on, on ask, is this also GPU ready? Because some of the libraries to run like a accelerator on GPU can be used on Julia? Um, so you mean on core GPU? Uh, yeah, or maybe next uh, problem other. When it's um, used. It will definitely be available for Perlmutter, um, barring um, major technical difficulties. Um, I, the, so um, packages like uh, CUDA.jl, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm currently setting them up for Core GPU. Um, maybe you can drop me your email and uh, we can, uh, or, or maybe we can chat on the NUG uh, Slack um, and uh, 
we can have a chat about how uh, you want to use Julia with GPUs. Yeah, because we are uh, just asking because we are we have some small group of scientists talking about you know uh, writing another new um, uh, numerical scheme to solve atomic flow, but we are also discussing which language that should be written in. And we are discussing, you know, still stick to Fortran and then use some open ACC to use, a, you know, a GPU or maybe use Python or some more, more, more modern language. And um, maybe I'll probably quickly through, you know, learn about Julia and, and think about it also. Yeah, thank you. I might uh, ask on the Slack uh, sometime later. Thank yes. you. Um, yeah, so um, this is, uh, I think, uh, a very good time to to think about uh, uh, when you're starting a new project, um, to think about whether uh, you want to try out Julia. Um, it's for applied math work. Um, the way it does multidimensional indices is very similar to uh, Fortran. So, um, uh, so that would be uh, a, a bonus uh, in favor of Julia. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That sounds great. Uh, so if anybody else has got any announcements, we'll move on to our topic of the day. So our topic of the day came uh, yeah, worryingly close to, to fruition uh, yeah, relatively recently with the, the wildfires, and that is that it's PSPS season. And yeah, unfortunately, the wildfires in California seem to have been getting worse from year to year. Um, last year, PG&E, who's our electricity provider, um, alerted us about three potential shutdown events and we lost power in two of them. So, you know, that was a, a pretty interesting learning experience. And, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people here probably uh, yeah, experienced it either directly from being in California or indirectly from, you know, by, by using NERSC. So the thing with these events is while pg &E tries to give us a, a decent amount of notice, you know, we, we don't always get heaps of notice. And so the big thing that's really at risk is if you've got a long running job. So if, if we get less than 48 hours notice and you've got a 48 hours running job, you know, if it's, if it's a shorter job, if it's a six hours running job, you know, we can stop it before it starts um, or, you know, prevent it from starting until after the, you know, everything's back up and, you know, that way you don't lose your job partway through. But uh, longer running jobs are particularly at, at risk. And so one good solution and, you know, possibly, possibly the best solution that we've got at the moment is to use checkpointing to break long jobs into shorter jobs. And we've got a few options about that. So in a few minutes, uh, Zenji, who's been uh, leading our uh, checkpoint restart efforts here at NERSC, will uh, give a, you know, a little bit of an overview of what the options are at NERSC and you know, some, some ideas of what you can do. And then we'll go into a more general Q&A about uh, PSPS season and uh, checkpoint restart. Um, before we start, so we have, um, Jeff Broughton, who is NERSC's um, uh, operations lead, is waiting, and Rebecca, who is part of the, uh, the communication team for these sort of events. Um, do either of you want to say something about PSPS season before, before we go into uh, Zinji's talk? I could give you just a brief uh, note. I mean, as you mentioned, um, well, from September to December, um, uh, California is in fire season. And um, you all probably heard about all the fires we had recently. Those were started by, uh, largely by lightning strikes. And, um, but PSPS events are somewhat different. Um, basically, those happen when we have dry conditions and we have high winds in the area. And the issue is 
that the high winds can uh, cause either the high tension lines uh, from our uh, utility uh, to um, uh, swing wildly, sometimes detach. Uh, also can be more conventional lines um, or having tree branches or things come down and take out uh, electrical equipment that then starts Your fire. Door just and um, that's the PG&E has basically been uh, lax in its maintenance uh, for many years and that has led to the events that we've had over the last several years. So in response, uh, what PG&E is doing is that they're actually turning off power uh, when there is a threat of these conditions actually causing a failure of the um, electrical uh, grid. So this is not necessarily something that would happen in the immediate vicinity of Berkeley Lab. Um, and in fact, the last big fire we had here uh, was in 1991. Um, this can basically, we can have a PSPS event because any of the uh, power lines that feed us, uh, not just the local ones, but the big high tension um, uh, lines that, that feed all of California are threatened and are, are taken down. So as, as Steve said, we get sort of uh, different kinds of warnings. Uh, they try and give us about 72 hour warning um, but uh, it can be as short as uh, just a few hours uh, to take the systems down. So that's the background of what happens. These Your garage are, door just closed. Sorry, I've got to mute my phone on this one. Um, so that's, that's the background of what PSPS events are, are about. They are things that are in response to weather conditions that can cause electrical fires. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we'll go into a, a general Q&A uh, after, or, or yeah, fairly, fairly shortly, but first, um, as a, you know, what you can actually do about it, kind of mitigation for uh, you know, this sort of thing, with other benefits as well. Um, Zenji has a, a few you know, notes and tips around checkpointing. Um, Zenji, would you like to share a screen or shall I um, present the slide and you say next? And let me share my screen. Okay. So, um, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, but we don't see a presentation. Okay. It might be might be the other screen. Now it's good? Looks good. Okay. So I think I have five minutes to talk about the CR options on Cori. So I'm Zhengzi from Nurse User Engagement Group. And uh, uh, I want to just list all um, our collaborators and, and my colleagues who worked to get uh, CR to work at Nurse. So just to start simple, so uh, what is checkpointing? So checkpointing is the action of saving the state of a running process to a file. We call it checkpoint image file. And then the process can later be restarted from that file and continuing from where it left off. Um, so there are two uh, types of you know, approaches to do the checkpointing. So one is uh, application internal checkpointing, and the other one is using external tool, um, it's transparent checkpointing. So in general, the internal checkpointing, um, I mean, the, it, it's quite limited. So I believe all the applications run on NERSC systems, they do have some sort of um, the checkpointing restart capability, but uh, we, I mean, the transparent checkpointing is much more desired because you can stop the code anytime and then you can start from exactly where they left off. So there are a lot of use cases for checkpointing and restart. 
but I just listed a few of them that's uh, directly relevant to your day-to-day -day use of NERSC systems. So it can enable, uh, a checkpoint restart uh, can enable long-running jobs, and then you can get better queue turnaround, and especially uh, in today's context, it can prepare for system failures. So the system failures can be as small as node failures that you, I think most of you should have seen that, and also including the PSPS PS events. Um, so uh, one of the bullets I list, listed here, prepare for the change in workload. It's not obvious for now, but we are expecting increasing uh, real-time workloads in the, in the next few years. So basically, we, um, I mean, those real-time workloads, they are high demanding and high priority workloads. So we may need to um, preempt partial or full system running jobs to serve these workloads. So early adoption of a CR approach actually has a long-term benefit uh, for you. Uh, so we aware the uh, CR has a one-time overhead and also impose extra work for you. So we created a queue called Flex QoS to provide a charging discount. And also uh, we developed the variable time job script to make your life easier when you use a um, checkpoint and restart. So variable time job script is a CERN batch script uh, with additional best batch directives and batch functions. And you can use them uh, with your applications if they can do internal checkpointing or if they can be checkpointed with external tools. So it can allow um, longer jobs to run in multiple shorter ones. Uh, so the user end, you just specify the minimum time in addition to the maximum time you usually need to specify. So system then find the best time slots for your job and then automatically resubmit until the job complete. So from the user perspective, um, you just need to submit one JavaScript and then check the result. Mm. And then um, the direct advantage of using that and benefit is improved queue turnaround because shorter jobs can make I mean better use of the backfill opportunity on the new system. So the available CR options now um, we can list a, a couple. So for the applications with internal CR support, uh, you can we recommend you to adopt variable time jobs. And also, if your job can generate useful result in a short time limit, uh, let's say in two hours, then you can use this FlexQL as that way you can get a great charging discount. Um, that's for application with internal checkpoint restart support. But for the applications without the internal checkpoint restart, we are working to get the MTCP to work with, uh, um, with this type of applications. Uh, currently, you can use the MTCP. Uh, this is, a, it stands for distributed multi-threaded checkpoint. Uh, this is a transparent CR tool developed by Northeastern University. So you can use this to uh, checkpoint your application. So I, uh, currently, as of today, uh, we have a module installed on Cori. That one works with the serial and the threaded applications only. With the MTCP, you can use it with variable time jobs and also uh, flex QoS. Uh, so to use that is pretty simple. So you just need, need to load the module and then another small module that is set um, and define a few batch functions and then start the coordinator. So I, I forgot to mention the MTCP is a coordinated checkpoint in restart tool. That means it has a one coordinator oversees all the activities of checkpointing and the restart and coordinate between them. 
So you need to start a coordinator and optionally specify the checkpoint interval and then launch the application, in this case, a.out under this DMTCP. Then your job can do the checkpointing. Um, and then later to restart, you just do the same thing, start a coordinator and then run the rep uh, script that the DMTCP provides. So I have to make a note here. Uh, so actually getting the transparent CR tools to work with production workload is quite challenging. So at NERSC, we have been in collaboration with the DMTCP team um, a couple of years by now, try to get the DMTCP to work with MPI workload, and especially the Cray MPG and the Aris network imposed some more difficulty for the DMTCP. So, so far, DMTCP doesn't work with uh, Cray MPG over Aris uh, network, but there is a new implementation in the MTCP called MANA, which is uh, quite promising. So it is, uh, MANA stands for MPI Agnostic, Network Agnostic, Transparent Checkpoint. So this is a plugin implemented in DMTCP. And we have been working with the developers and also NERSC interns, and uh, have already gotten it to work with the uh, bus uh, Gromax, uh, and also used to uh, um, make it, um, I worked with HPCG to do some overhead evaluation. So BASP is our number one applications at NERSC, can consume like up to, uh, it's like more than 15% of the computing cycles. So we are very excited on this capability working for BASP. So currently, uh, the developers need to wrap up their script to make the user interface more friendly. So we plan to um, make a module available in next month. And right after that, we are planning to host user trainings to help users adopt this manner in their workload. So during um, getting the CR to work for nurse workload, we realized a strong and active CR community is very important for having anything that will work for production workload. I mean, the transparent um, CR tools. So we are hosting a checkpoint to over, I mean, a symposium on checkpointing in next February, try to get researchers and practitioners and developers and also end users together. And this workshop featured the latest work in, in checkpoint restart research, tools development and production use. So we highly encourage those uh, participation from nurse users, and especially we are interested in you share experience with, uh, I mean, share your experience on adopting CR tools in your production workloads. So some details here. We are still working out the details and planning to uh, release the CFP soon like this week. These are some reference uh, with some training materials and documentation. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Zenji. So there's a, a link to Zenji's slides um, in, the, in the webinars channel of the MUG. Slack, so you can um, you know, jump back in and yeah, see them again. Um, what we'll do next, yeah, let's just share the screen, um, is a open Q and A session. Uh, here we are. So we have on the call uh, Jeff. You heard from before, who is the deputy of, deputy of uh, operations at NERSC, and Rebecca is on the call as well. You've uh, no doubt heard from her in um, you know, many nurse communications and uh, she, yeah, she leads the nurse team that makes sure that our users are kept updated when events like this happen. And uh, Zenji, of course, is uh, with us who is our checkpointing expert. Um, so I'll 
open the floor, please uh, yeah, raise a hand and or uh, unmute yourself and speak up with any uh, questions or comments around PSPS, uh, checkpointing and you know, being prepared for this sort of event. So I'll start with one for Zenji. Um, do you have to use the flex queue to use variable time jobs and or checkpointing? No, you don't have to use a flex QoS. I think flex QoS could have a very, um, I mean the time minimum requirement could be too short for some of the workloads. So anyway, uh, that's not required to use variable. That's an additional thing. If you use that, then you can get so I understand. And the flex QoS is KNL nodes only, but, but so you can still you can still use variable time jobs for has all work. Just using a regular QoS. Everybody seems to be feeling shy. Oh, Stephen! Yay! <laughs> you can always trust me to have a question. Um, so, what are the current expectations for keeping up edge services during a PSPS? Will the center be entirely down, or is there any chance that things like spin, disks, login nodes, DTNs could remain alive on generator power or something? So we're hopeful this year we're going to be able to do a better um, job of keeping the auxiliary services up. Um, it turns out the old uh, um, common file system, um, the hardware that it was running on was uh, not super robust uh, when we had to run on uh, backup power. Uh, since that has been uh, taken out of service and replaced with CFS, um, we're actually in a, uh, I think, a much better situation. And um, so we're expecting that we'll be able to keep most of the auxiliary services up um, during uh, events this year. Thanks, that would be hugely helpful. Never used quite sure what to ask. Maybe we already answered all their questions. <laughs> well, if if you do have questions, um, you can also, also um, yeah either send us a ticket or keep discussing it offline. And you know we'll we will make a, a you know, a very strong point about you know making sure that uh, people are updated you know, when these events happen. You know, uh, often things are kind of unfolding in real time and you know, we don't know exactly what's going on either. Um, but you know, those, those of you who were nurse users last year uh, probably remember you know, quite a, a lot of you know, uh, regular messages from Rebecca during the, you know, during the PSPS outages and alert times with, you know, here's what we know that uh, hopefully make it you know, a little bit easier for you, know, for you to make um, you know, make decisions about you know what what jobs to submit and you know how to arrange your workflow you know when there when there is these disruptions going on yeah so one of the things last year was that i was on the emergency management team so i had all the inside scoop because i was you know there when things were happening um I am still on the team. However, I think it'll probably be somewhat more of a reduced scope at this, you know, this year if we have a PSPS, but I will still try to 
get as much info as I can and keep you all informed. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're, we're reaching the top of the hour and we have a, a couple more fairly short items on our agenda. The first one, and most of this conversation can probably happen in, um, you know, offline in, in Slack. Uh, typically in the past, these, these uh, you know, meetings and webinars have been on a third Thursday of the month schedule. And this month we, we pushed it to the fourth Thursday to um, you know, work around some, some calendar clashes, but next month we'll return to a third Thursday schedule. So it should be a you know, fairly predictable time frame. Um, we are open to and always looking for uh, topic requests and suggestions. So if there's an element of NERSC that you would like to learn more about, this is this is one sort of you know, great opportunity for it. Uh, another is you know, we had these these you know, really fascinating success stories at the top of the hour, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, yeah, I think any or all of those would actually make a great topic for a topic of the day. And, and you know, what we're looking for there is kind of like what, what um, Zenji's just presented. Just, just a few slides, five or 10 minutes of telling us about, you know, something interesting that, um, that you're doing that, you know, maybe interesting or beneficial to other nurse users to learn about. So this is a, you know, an opportunity to show off your work as well as, um, as well as to you know, request um, topics of interest. So yeah, if you'd like to either request a topic or nominate someone or self-nominate to, um, to present a topic of the day at an upcoming meeting, um, yeah, let us know either, either via Slack or via a ticket. Or yeah, wave a hand now if, uh, if something's already on your mind. And our final agenda item is a quick look at last month's numbers. So I, I attempted doing a little bit of a visualization of our availability, but uh, I think the, the lines show the events, but not necessarily the, the duration here. Um, we had, uh, we, we did unfortunately have a few outages during uh, August, but overall we had a 97.3% a uh, scheduled availability, which means that you know, apart from scheduled outages, you know, you know, maintenance outages, the, the system was you know, available sort of, you know, according to the specs of that 97.3% uh, of the time. And the, um, you know, the storage systems were 100% the whole way through August. So that was, that was good. Um, our utilization for Cori uh, was also 90, uh, over 97%, so 97.3%. Uh, we have a, 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 one of our metrics that we report to the Department of Energy is about uh, capability jobs. So jobs that use basically a, a, a large fraction of the machine and uh, the threshold is at um, 1,024 nodes. And so we have a, a target you know, uh, to, to spend 25% you know, or more of our nurse hours uh, on these jobs that really can only run at a facility like NERSC. And um, we've been getting quite a few of those lately. And so, you know, in August, 35.1% um, you know, was on uh, of uh, you know, Corey's hours for on large jobs. Uh, tickets incoming and outgoing. So we tend to get over the last few years in the order of 500 tickets a month. And that trend seems to be sitting about there. Uh, in August, if I calculated correctly, we got just shy of 500 new tickets. We closed just shy of 600 tickets, which, which is great because yeah, we've always got a bit of a backlog of tickets that you know, aren't easy to instantly answer. Uh, so we've got a current backlog of 485. And I forgot to put the number here, but I think we we're, were at uh, somewhere in the 92, 93% um, of tickets, meaning we have a, a SLA that we report to the DOE uh, to address tickets in three business days uh, with a target of 80%. Uh, so you know, we're uh, happy to report that for the majority of tickets, you know, over 92% over of tickets in August, we're able to address them 
within that um, time frame. So that's everything that we had on our agenda, and we've gone a couple of minutes over. But again, yeah, we can uh, keep talking on Slack before we finalise. Is there anything else that we didn't think of for this meeting that you'd like to bring up as either an agenda item we should uh, add or yeah, just a general comment or announcement that was missed earlier? It looks like no, but um, thank you all for joining us today and we'll look forward to yeah, chatting with you in in general through through our panels, but also at our next monthly meeting next month. Thank you all. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.